In this session, we're going to talk about how movements form, movement formation. And um, I was just talking to Mary King, and I was saying that for years, what I did, what I was most interested in, was looking at the issue of what movements did once they were formed. I like to look at what movements could do once they had 100,000 or a million people. And what did they do with that? And it's only been recently in the last couple of years that I've started thinking a lot more about the issue, well, how do movements get there? How do movements form themselves? And I'm now convinced that it's, it's one of the most important issues in this field, how these things get started. And by things, I mean movements and campaigns. Mm -hmm incredibly critical to look at. Now, <clears throat> in this session, what I want to do is engage in discussion with you guys. And by the way, it's, a, it's really an honor to be here before all of you because listening to you guys talk for about 47 seconds each earlier today, I mean, the, the diversity is just amazing and the range of experience is amazing. So we definitely want to draw from you guys for this, for this conversation. But I also, I will, you know, I do have a PowerPoint and I, want to go through issues such as when do movements form? Under what circumstances do they form? Conventional wisdom is that when things get bad enough in a certain place, when people are suffering enough in a certain place, movements will form. And yet we see lots of places around the world where the suffering is immense and been going on for a long time and movements aren't forming. And we see other places where the suffering is pretty bad and movements are forming or other places where the suffering is immense and they're forming. Then there's the issue of trigger events. People say, well, look, this movement formed because an event triggered it. Something happened and the movement came out of that event. But this leads us to the question of what makes a trigger event? I mean, societies that are misruled and corrupt have no shortage of trigger events usually. And yet, for some reason, at some point, some event suddenly becomes a trigger event. We're going to start to look at why that might be. Um, we're also going to talk a bit about the role of skills. Not just look at conditions, but look at what people can do to try to form and shape movements themselves. So my presentation has four parts. Uh, it's not an academic presentation, but I am going to give you somewhat academic definitions of three terms. So I'm talking about civil resistance movements and campaigns. So I've got to define civil resistance movements and campaigns. We'll get through that pretty quickly, and then I want to engage in a discussion about under what circumstances movements form with all you guys. I want to talk about skills, and in particular focus on three. We're going to look at movement discourse, movement language, the logic by which movements articulate their reason to be and their methodology. And we're going to look at how movement discourse perhaps differs from conventional political discourse. We're going to look at how movement discourse is able to unify people, empower them, and so forth. We're also going to look at the importance of knowledge and strategy. Discourse is really important, and it's a skill in movement formation. So is knowing where to apply force and how to apply force, and the role and importance of diffusion of knowledge about nonviolent struggle in movement formation. And then the last skill I want to hit on is the ability to self-organize people as well as the ability to mobilize existing capacities. So when movements form, there may be lots of civil society groups that haven't been doing much, and suddenly a movement forms, and if it's skillful, it can bring those civil society groups into its movement and grow quite quickly. How does that happen? And then the last point, if we have time, and I bet we won't, but we'll probably hit on it anyway <laughs> through the course of discussion, is for those of you who may be journalists or working in NGOs in the field, how do you identify the early stages of movements? What do they look like? What do you look for? It's not necessarily going to be a protest of thousands of people that's going to show you movements coming. But subtle shifts, differences, there are things you can look for that can lead you off to, to think, well, this may be different than just a one-off protest. This may actually go somewhere. Let's talk about those four issues. So definitions. Can someone give me a definition or just some characteristics of civil resistance, briefly? If you were to define this term, what the what's the it that's not an it? Yes? Uh, deny the legitimacy of the state. Okay, so civil resistors deny their, the legitimacy of their adversary. Yes. 
that's one of the things that they can do. What else? Nonviolent. It's nonviolent. Number yes. Of Pardon? Number, number of okay, depends on numbers generally to be effective. What else? Alternative power. Okay. Alternative to conventional power? Yeah. Okay. Persuade Pardon? Persuade to do okay. Depends on legitimacy and persuasion in order to function. It should have some idea as to they stand for. Okay. Some mission. So it's not just a no, it's also a yes. <coughs> they know what they stand against and they know what they're fighting for. Great. Yeah? Some kind of human rights framework. Human rights framework. Generally, Civil resistance is used for human rights, broadly conceived, whether corruption <coughs> or transparency. Yeah, women's rights, indigenous rights, and so forth, labor rights. Other Excuse associations? Me, could I just, just point out that most human rights have had to be fought for through civil resistance. So it goes two ways here. Thank you for that good point. Yeah. It's mass organization to combat the mass problem? Yep, often, often. Raising awareness. Yeah, these are all characteristics. Yeah, great. Organize with the people uh, behaving in a way that they don't normally behave towards the attainment of a very specific goal or set of demands. I like that. Good. Yeah. We just got civil resistance and it's part of movement put together there, civil resistance movement. If we just look at civil resistance, there's components of what many of you said. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the uh, Gene Sharp's definition or my paraphrasing of Gene Sharp's definition. Gene Sharp used the term nonviolent action when he wrote his book, The Politics of Nonviolent Action, in 1973. And just to, you know, make sure I'm obeying the rules of PowerPoint presentations, I have pictures. There's Gene, and there's his book in 1973, The Politics of Nonviolent Action. And part of what Gene did in this book is he came up with a, with a whole framework a systematic framework for understanding nonviolent movements, civil resistance movements. And he defined his terms quite, quite precisely. So my paraphrase is civil resistance is a way for ordinary people to wield power without using violence. It consists of three kinds of acts. First, acts of commission. Can someone give me an example of an act of commission? This is when people do something that they're not supposed to do, not expected to do, or forbidden to do. So acts of commission might be protests. It's the most common one. Wearing symbols that are forbidden or, or you know, radical, whatever. Um, <clears throat> a whole host of communicative, demonstrative actions. And I would add, by the way, that all of us in our lives have engaged in these, whether we call ourselves activists or not. I mean, we all were children once. And children are remarkable at finding ways to do things that they're not supposed to do, expected to do, or required to do, right? I mean, it's sort of fundamental to who we are as human beings that we learn how to disobey very early on. In fact, I'd say we're born knowing how to disobey, right? <laughs> so then the next kind of act is an act of omission. This is when people don't do things that they're supposed to do, expected to do, or required by law to do. So here we can get really creative. Because there's lots of different ways you can withhold consent and obedience, right? Withdrawing bank accounts, boycotting products, boycotting institutions, strikes, and there are lots of kinds of strikes. Resigning from positions. Social ostracism, not talking to people who may be, you know, collaborators with an adversary. There are lots of different kinds of tactics that fall into this category. And then the third category, according to Sharp, was a combination of both. So for example, we, one tactic could be taking my kids out of a public school and creating a home school for them, creating a parallel institution, creating some sort of new organization that rechannels energy, rechannels people's time, energy, resources. And at the core of this is sort of a few things come out of this. Number one, is voting or lawsuits part of this <laughs> definition? Is this sort of is conventional political methods part of this definition? Under certain circumstances. Yeah, you could say circumstantially. But not from my point of view. But not from Reverend Lawson's point of view. <laughs> and, and not from Gene Sharp's point of view. He, yeah.
Where would you, because I mean, this is a problem, an increasing problem in some European countries, increasing movements that are probably in you know, racism, xenophobia, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and in a way, maybe you could call that civil resistance, because there are people and they're using unusual means, like you said, to fight for what they believe is right. I mean, I don't believe it's right, but they do, and they are getting increasing amounts of followers. Uh, how will you put those? Well, we, you mean people might choose to disobey or do things for causes that, that you know, you or we don't like. Yeah, I mean, that's happened. Talk about the nonviolence as, as if everything is for Well, reason, also historically, historically, if you look at most cases, they do kind of bend towards the sort of more human rights respecting outcomes and objectives. But that doesn't mean that there aren't cases. For example, minorities can be severely hurt if people boycott their businesses. Mm -hmm. And this has happened. So what we're talking about here is force. Now this force does depend often on a lot of people agreeing to something in order to be effective. So if you're going to use it for a really negative purpose, you've got to have a lot of people really believing in that negative purpose. Were there comments about that? Yeah, right. Alan. No, uh, just getting back to the previous point, I think civil resistance by, it, by definition makes its own rules and therefore does not play by the pre-established rules of the institutions, yeah. whether those be elections or uh, legislation in Congress or whatever. Those things are by definition outside of civil resistance because civil resistance is by definition anti-institutional. Yeah. I would say civil resistance is by definition outside of institutions, but not necessarily anti. For example, movements will, of course, you know, civil rights movement used it in conjunction with lawsuits and the election system, but they used it because they realized that the lawsuits and election system were insufficient. So yeah, it's extra institutional action, I would agree with that. Okay, yes, Sharif, and then we got to go on. Yeah, just to carry on what you were just saying and, and, and what Al was saying, yes, but after you've tried to go through the conventional methods and at times you try to um, to use the conventional methods to actually embarrass the regime knowing that that's not enough but then at step one for instance I think in the US a lot of that happened in the Supreme Court or in other courts and then that became the uh, you know the base for going outside of the institutional uh, the institutional uh, methods that are, are standard yeah so, Tim. Uh, as I as I have worked in this area, and as I as I continue to be engaged in struggle in, in communities, uh, I think that uh, I've come to the conclusion that that civil resistance, nonviolent struggle, nonviolent. Politics and all is about creating power grids that conventional wisdom does not know exists. <coughs> Aristotle said that power is the capacity to achieve purpose. So that it's a kind of given from creation itself. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that what I've seen happen, all time happen in Cairo, is that people come together, they formulate a mass, they do the acts of omission and commission. That puts in Cairo, in Egypt, a whole new dimension of power. Mm -hmm that Barak, U.S. government, nobody else has considered being available. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply wielding power, it's more than that. It is taking advantage of power that's available and not seen and not used. Yes, thank you. I agree with you completely, and that is actually a point I want to hit on in movement formation because Later on, we'll get to this, I'll, I'll share some uh, excerpts from speeches and statements made by movements. And a central thing that they do is they remind people that they are powerful. 
And they don't just remind it that people, they show them that they are powerful. So that reclaiming of power, or even just recognition of power, I think is central. Okay, movement. This is actually this is quite a tough term to define. I struggled for a long time and then gave up and, and, and looked at what other soci you know, social scientists were saying, and then I kind of liked what they were saying. So, but do people have any thoughts or ideas they want to throw out before we go on to the, the book definition? <coughs> Movements, they do engage in change, yes. Or they, they advocate for change. See, it's tricky, isn't it? Pardon? It's just a group of people that have objectives that they want to achieve and they work together towards you know, the achievement of those goals, whether by expanding the movement or by uh, engaging um, in acts, omission, or commission, what have you, to, to achieve those things. Okay. It's, it's broad, yeah, that's a broad definition. My definition is a little bit more <coughs> narrow than that. But yeah, I mean, that's the gist of it. And here's sort of a definition that I, I took from a few different sources and mixed it up and made my own sandwich out of it, and there it is. Um, <coughs> but what about military-based movements and, and insurrections? And, uh, I mean, in, in Egypt, you had several of these organizations, uh, you know, black ops and what have you, and undercover that, were, that existed that were armed, that were uh, not civilian, not necessarily civilian-based. They were very pro bono in, in their own sense of uh, what they were doing. Uh, Are, were these civil resistance, engaging in civil resistance or, or violence? Some of the acts were violence and some of the acts were not. Well, and, because, so I'm going to sidestep you because about. I'm just focused on civil resistance movements. So there are other kinds of movements. But because I'm just going to focus on civil resistance movements, I mean, you know, there are, there are lots of good definitions of this term. I'm just putting a one, you know. And it's basically people, ongoing collective efforts of people for a particular objective, in, w engaging in civil resistance for the purposes of our conversation. They involve widespread p participation. They alert, educate, and mobilize people. And part of what, <laughs> what comes out of this definition for me is something that Jack hit on. Movements cannot be commanded. They cannot be ruled. There is no, in the army, if you disobey, you can be court-martialed. In a corporation, you can be fired. Here, it's legitimacy. People come out because they volunteer, because they believe in what's going on. This is a very different kind of dynamic, then. For movement, legitimacy and the ability to persuade is incredibly important. I would say more important than probably for any other social entity you can think of. Because otherwise, people don't get out and sacrifice. So legitimacy is at the core of these movements. They have to represent people. And what do movements do? They oftentimes engage in campaigns. And a campaign is a series of repetitive actions, durable, organized, observable tactics and actions that are directed to achieve a certain goal. So for example, Reverend Lawson yesterday talked about campaigns every year in the civil rights movement, whether it was the Freedom Rides, whether it was Nashville, whether it was uh, Selma, Birmingham, and so forth. So these are the three key terms. I think you all got them. We'll keep moving. So under what conditions do civil resistance movements form, or civil resistance campaigns form? What needs to happen? Open question to you guys. When people find there is no legitimacy in what's going on. Okay. So when there's no legitimacy. Injustices. Injustices. Oppression. Oppression such as? No, it's not. Mm hmm Sure. Okay. A trigger, an event that... A trigger event. Yeah. So people need to have... Al. Diversity of tactics. In other words, a protest is not a civil resistance unless it, it is accompanied by a whole series of other actions and steps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Depending on uh, the situation people live in and the amount, putting all these together, the levels of oppression are really high and there is people are pushed to the corner there's nothing more that you can do you've tried everything you've tried your legal right. way legal battles you've tried uh, persuading them but nothing has happened so the only way is come to the street you not only the street but then civil resistance starts from there on yeah so i heard i heard a few things and and i think they're all relevant 
Number one, people have to have grievances, of course. It has to be discontent. Now, some people would say, well, the grievances have to get really, really bad. Really bad. Like, I heard one Egyptian woman who I was heard interviewed, and she, she said, well, why, the question was, why was the revolution now? And she said, neoliberalism. People were so hurt economically that they felt they must come out. Okay? But then there are other places, of course, where, you know, People have grievances, but they're not, I don't have enough to eat, and they still come out. So sometimes the severity of the grievance, if people get the, the grievance is too severe, they actually don't organize. So there's no hard, fast rule there. When there's no traditional option of political change open, we've tried negotiations, we've tried lawsuits, elections, we may have even tried armed conflict. I mean, if you look at certain movements, particularly self-determination movements like in East Timor, West Papua, South Africa, where people used arms, and even that didn't work. And at that point, or hopefully before that point, in the case of violence, people decide, okay, nothing else is working. The system has lost legitimacy. We've got to do something. And then the third thing was the trigger event. So let's talk about trigger events for a second. Can, can people give you some examples of trigger events? Brock. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, great. Self-immolation in Tunisia is a trigger event, yeah. Sure, Khaled Saeed, a blogger who was reporting on corruption, taken out, beaten, killed. Facebook page starts, 100,000 followers. Pardon? I don't know what that is. She gave a testimony on YouTube that people should rise up against the Oh, yeah, 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 okay. What else? Pardon? Yeah. The death of Huya Bang in 1989 in China created a place for people to have a funeral, vigils, led to a call for reform. Yeah. Other movements, like in the other country, like could be inspiring other people, that like, could be a trigger. Yeah. Sure. And what these trigger events usually do, I would say, is one of three things. And we're, I'll emphasize one thing. We're focusing just on conditions now. We're going to get to skills and agency later. I'm not saying that these are the only things that cause movements. But these trigger events usually do a couple things. They empower people, like Tunisia. My gosh, they did it. Maybe we can do it. They reveal power that people have. Or they completely delegitimize an oppressor or a system. Right? Um, <clears throat> or they instill they reveal at least a weakness, a lack of control that an oppressor has. So trigger event could even be, you know, a natural disaster that comes and the response is completely inept. The trigger event could also be nonviolent action, by the way. Before a movement's formed, there are a lot of trigger events that are brought about by small nonviolent actions that suddenly can take hold. Now the conventional wisdom is that if you have deep grievances, no traditional option of political change, a triggering event, you're going to get a resistance movement of some, of some form. I was looking after, e you know, after Egypt, I read all, you know, what the pundits were making sense of it, and I read one where a woman came up with, a woman and her colleague came up with, what was it called? It was the, uh, the Uprising Index, where they look at various corruption, political rights, economic development variables, and come up with a list of countries where the next uprisings were most likely to occur kind of follows this, this model. Now is this, uh, what else is needed here? Are these the, th the only three things that people look for? Organization. organization. Underground organization. Underground organization, so state of civil society. Yeah. What else? Critical mass. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there has to be a, a latent a, a capacity there somewhere to resist. There's Networks. Yeah. Pardon? A small group of, or maybe a large and de decentralized group of planners, but people need to know what they're doing. What else? Leadership. leadership. What does leadership do? Not necessarily. Strategize. Strategize. Take Plan. Initiative. Okay. And shared concerns. Shared concerns. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole different frame that goes on in people's minds where they say, maybe this time, it's not because I'm lazy that I can't get a job. It's not because I'm bad that I can't get a job. Maybe it's because the system is messed up. And maybe that's why I don't have a job and lots of other people don't have jobs and maybe we can do something about it. 
Jim. But two, two illustrations. When solidarity uh, out of its uh, 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 defeats in the 70s, when some of the organizers reformed, re 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 restructured, they made a determination that they would not encourage or allow any kinds of sporadic violence. That they were going to strictly develop a nonviolent movement. That was in the very early 80s, after already 10 or so years of struggle. Mm -hmm. So they put in place a systematic approach to nonviolence, and they were reading King and Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Uh, another illustration is that when Rosa Parks on December the 1st, 1955, was arrested, she was already an activist in that community under segregation tyranny mm -hmm. for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. And she was a part of a group of women who had been saying for at least two years, we ought to have a bus boycott to deal with the indignities of this segregation. Yeah. So there were there was there was a preparatory period that, mm -hmm. that prepared her and, and other people in the community who when she was arrested they they went into action to call a boycott. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think my point my response to that would be yes. And that basically Part of the difficulty in talking about movement formation is saying, when does a movement even really begin? Did it begin when Rosa Parks even began to be educated and thinking about it and talking with people? Or did it begin with her act of sitting on the bus? Or did it begin with the subsequent mobilization afterwards? And it's very difficult to, when you follow these events back, what you see are these long trails of prior mobilization, prior thinking, and prior planning. And so that is definitely there. The other point I would make is that this presentation, by virtue of the fact that we have you know, an hour, hour and a half, movement formation is something that has been written about for decades and is extremely complicated, as any social phenomenon is. So there's no way we can get all the factors here there are indeed factors that you know, will be left out of this presentation, but just sort of some of the salient ones that I see anyway. But yeah, I agree with you completely, Jim. I mean, when people talk about the January 25th movement in Egypt, what about the April 6th movement in 2008? Mm -hmm. And what about Kafaya in 2004, 2005, 2006? What about Egyptians against corruption? <coughs> what about Shafin.com? And so, if you look at the way these movements start to build on prior mobilization, you see how prior mobilization starts to change the conditions so that by the time January 25th comes along, the conditions are really looking quite favorable. And that favorability is in large part due to the last five or six years. Yeah? I think even before the movement comes to place, there is some amount of collective thinking that's already there, which incubates the way in which people are supposed to think, and it's, it's a form, the, the trigger point just brings people together for the action, actually, and then they start, start coming together, and they have some legs to miss after that. But if you look at, in India, the resistance movements against communalism started in 1925. But very, very long before all the other communal parties came together. Mm -hmm. And it was a slow build-up. Mm -hmm. Like that, I think a trigger point is something that helps people to converge. Mm -hmm. They are divergent, and then suddenly there's something happens and everybody comes together and says, okay, this is what... I, I, I agree with you. I would never be one to say trigger points are really the most important thing. I would probably argue they're one of the least important things. They're more a symbol of what's already happened on the ground rather than the thing that actually creates what's on the ground. But I'm just going through what the sort of conventional wisdom tells us is, my gosh, look at Tunisia. It was WikiLeaks. You know, WikiLeaks did it, or Mohamed Bouazizi when he immolated himself. And yet, as Mary King once noted to me, 
Bouazizi was not the first person to immolate himself in Tunisia. It had been going on before and before and before that. So, yeah. Khaled Saeed was not the first one killed by Egyptian police. But some people, and in some instances, become iconic of mm -hmm. a movement. Yeah. Yep. And Khaled Saeed is one such case. Yeah. And he was personally involved in activism, ju activism just as Rosa Parks was involved <coughs> in activism prior to her becoming the icon of the, the civil resistance, the civil uh, rights movement. Yep. It's an accumulation of events. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, I'm not surprised you guys see it this way. Is this what you're reading in the papers when you read about movements? No. No. But, <laughs> yeah, that's part of the point. I'm not surprised that a bunch of civil society participants and, and, and watchers get it. But, yeah. Uh, was there another comment there? Yeah. I think that another important characteristic that when the uh, civil resistance and movement came form is when the people overcome the fear mm -hmm. and they are more enthusiastic to participate. Yes. And this is, this is something that I, in my point of view, it's what in Mexico is happening, that we are still in fear and terror. Mm -hmm. So people cannot be really engaged mm -hmm. on participating on this, in this kind of movements, like for example the one that Cecilia is, is leading. Javier Cecilia, who's going to speak here, yes? Yeah, he's going to speak here. Great. So for those who don't know Javier Cecilia, you will. And you will be moved. Okay, I'm going to keep going because we've got a lot of great points and actually some of them are going to be echoed in the forthcoming slides. So my argument to you today is it ain't just that. It's not just grievances, no traditional option, and a triggering event. It's the ability to frame events, which movements can do. It's knowledge, which sometimes extends back for years. I should probably add another point. Point four, prior mobilization is usually really important before a movement takes off. And what's interesting about prior mobilization is you could look at Kefai and say, oh, Kefai failed in Egypt. They didn't get the constitution changed. And then you could look at April 6th and say, well, in April 6th, movement in Facebook, you know, they organized <laughs> solidarity actions with striking, with striking workers in Suez, and students and activist intellectuals got out, and they failed. Well, they didn't fail. I mean, okay, they failed at their immediate objective, but they built solidarity there, which became really important when? And so these, all these failures suddenly lead to a success. The fourth, and part of that, what this prior mobilization does is it builds capacity, which is really critical. So let's talk about the role of skills. Um, <clears throat> discourse. So how does movement discourse differ, differ from you know, conventional political babble, conventional political party platforms? What do movements do when they talk? They dramatize. Okay, so can you give an example? Like, uh, basically the placards they had of Mubarak in Tahrir Square. Mm -hmm. You know, with his horns and the devil, and, you know, his face charred off, stuff like that. They use symbols often. Yes, what else? Uh, telling grievances and the hope. But how? I mean, like, politicians do it too. But I know that, for example, the way politicians, democratic politicians in this country talk isn't necessarily organizing, mobilizing a movement. Barack Obama did a little bit and then kind of trailed off. The, I guess from the 1960s, make the personal political. Be creative. Pardon? Creative. Creative discourse. Say more about that. What's an example? In a way that uh, people get to see something unfamiliar, unusual, and that attach people. Okay. If it's too unfamiliar, though, what happens? Daily, maybe. So there's this kind of tightrope they have to walk, new, but if it's so new, no one really gets it. Yeah. One good example of that was what they did in Serbia, uh, of Akbar mm -hmm. Gostov Ye. He's finished against Slobodan Milosevic. Mm -hmm. That became like a slogan. Which we're going to see tonight in the film. Yeah. yeah. They were quite good at messaging these old poor guys. And you're actually going to meet Ivan Marovic, one of the one of the founders and leaders, and you can ask him all about it. I think he's brilliant with communications. So let's look at a few things. Marty. Yeah. Song. 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 Say more, Mary. Well, for example, in the civil rights movement, the development of a whole body of freedom songs was phenomenally important. Mm -hmm. It, you mentioned fear back here. Yeah, yeah. Certain freedom songs were sung when people were afraid that the next day someone would be killed. 
and at that time, the singing would be in the churches for mass meetings, which were the main form of training, because there was no internet. <laughs> uh, but might be singing, this may be the last time we see each other. But another time, when it was to go out and confront a police commissioner, it would be about that police commissioner. So a whole enormous body of songs and a tradition of changing in performance. You modified the song. No pride of authorship. The songs were phenomenally important. The whole discourse was shaped. Yeah. 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 Okay, that got some more hands up. Um, I want to take quick comments, but I really want to keep going because we have 35 minutes. So Constantin, yes. Uh, some signs, either flowers or colors that uh -huh. uh, different now, movements use. Why are symbols so important in communication? Uh, because why it, do they use so much? it allows people to feel that there are many supporters. Mm -hmm. that, like you can't be arrested because you wear orange scarf, for example. Mm -hmm. But you easily show other people that you support the movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing that was very popular in Bangladesh in the late 1980s during the anti Ashad movement, the downfall yeah. of the dictator, was street theater. Uh -huh. That was that got people talking, it attracted big crowds, people could relate to that. That was, that was really good. Mm -hmm. was very popular. Mm -hmm. If I saw a bunch of people doing theater on the street, I'd stop. I'd pay attention and I'd laugh, probably. Yeah. I just want to add that all participatory. Yeah, means of communication like theater and everything is very important and having it a process and having everybody participate. Mm -hmm. So artists really matter. And I don't mean artists in like fine art, you know, those who have been trained to do this or that. I mean artists. People who are creative and who find new ways to communicate, new meanings. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things that they have to do is they have to define what the problem is. What's the problem? Okay? One aspect of discourse, of course, has to be what are we so upset about, right? So how do movements describe the problem? <coughs> I have some quotes to show you afterwards. I could just, you know, I'm just going to go on to the quotes and let them speak for themselves. This is a jewel. This is a gem I found on the internet. This is a statement by Gandhi in 1922 when he was being tried for writing several articles that were deemed seditious. In fact, they were in violation of what? He was charged with bringing or attempting to excite disaffection towards His Majesty's government established by law in British India for articles that he'd written. And he got up and gave a remarkable statement to the court. Which he st and he started by talking about how he wanted to believe earlier in his life when he was in South Africa that the British system had an intrinsic goodness to it. Even though he knew it was unjust, he thought he could eventually earn his equality if he worked hard enough. He volunteered as a medic in wars that the British fought. He really believed that he could achieve equality. And then he comes to this. And I, I use this quote, I mean, there are great quotes from Gandhi, but this is 1922. This is before the Salt March of 1931. This is when the movement was new, okay? I came reluctantly to the conclusion that the British connection had made India more helpless than she ever was before, politically and economically. She has become so poor that she has little power of resisting famines. Before the British advent, India spun and wove cloth in her millions of cottages, just the supplement she needed for adding to her meager agricultural resources. This cottage industry of cloth spinning, so vital for India's existence, has been ruined by incredibly heartless and in human processes as described by English witness. So, let's get to the next part of the speech where he says this. This is really the problem. Little to do town dwellers know how the semi-starved masses of India are slowly sinking into lifelessness. Little do they know that their miserable comfort represents the brokerage they get for their work they do for the foreign exploiter. That the profits in the brokerage are sucked from the masses Little do they realize that the government established by law in British India is carried on for this exploitation of the masses. Ninety years ago, folks, this is what he said. Is this movement talk? I haven't heard a politician talk this way. Not too many, anyway. Right? 
I mean, what was amazing when I saw this is, my gosh, I can think of people who would use this kind of statement today. So what's he doing here? How's he describing the problem? He's assigning blame. He's pointing out the perpetrators. He's connecting the grievances to the, the political and the other. He's reframing the problem in the sense that their suffering is not because they're poor. It's because someone it's is because making the them poor. the system is completely corrupt. So a lot of times movements will define problems systematically or, or, as, a, or as, as a part of the, the system. That doesn't mean that movements don't advocate reforms. They're not always necessarily trying to overthrow the system. You know, a well-placed reform campaign can be very useful to a movement. But this description leaves no confusion, no ambiguity about where Gandhi stands and what the real problem is, not just the symptoms, the real problem. OK. Another early movement speech, Martin Luther King. This is what, 1955 was? Yeah. So at the beginning, at the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycotts, when they founded the Montgomery Improvement Association, we're having a mass meeting, and Martin Luther King was not yet a well-known. He was not yet dubbed the leader of the civil rights movement. Here's how he addressed the church when he was trying to tell people we would not ride on buses. We're here in a specific sense because of the bus situation in Montgomery. So here's the local grievance dramatized for you. We are here because we are determined to get the situation corrected. The situation is not at all new. The problem has existed over endless years. For many years now, Negroes in Montgomery and so many other areas have been inflicted with the paralysis of crippling fear on buses in our community on so many occasions. And then his speech starts to take a turn. Negroes have been intimidated and humiliated and oppressed because of the sheer fact that they were Negroes, a much broader statement. So we have this problem with the buses. It's extremely real for us. It's personal for us. And it's part of a much larger problem. OK. Comments or questions before you go on? OK. How, how do movements tend to define the perpetrators, the people causing the problems, or the system? What are some considerations? There are different ways. The first is uh, to convince everybody saying that these are a group of exploiters. That's the framing. And now sometimes movements also dehumanize them for a, to give them a larger than life image, saying that these guys are actually sucking life out of us. Mm -hmm. They use the media. But I want to know the message. How do they define? Who are you up against if you're a movement? The system, but OK, but say more. Like, what, what kind of language? I mean, if you say we're just against the system, period, then what happens? If a movement says it's just against this, the whole system, it's the figureheads. So some movements will take a very small group and make them the them. And it's us against them. And if you're at the lower end of the bureaucratic ladder, we're not against you. But it's just these guys, or these women, or these people. This five, or 10, or 100 people. <coughs> That's one way that movements often do it. What is this? Someone from Egypt tell me. <coughs> January 27th, 20,000 of these appeared at places around Cairo. This was part of a larger. Part of a, this is part of a 26-page pamphlet called How to Protest Intelligently. They gave people some examples of signs they could use. Look at how they're, they, here they're not even defining the, po the opponent so much as defining who the opponent isn't. Okay? Here's a sample sign you could use. And here is the strategy in action. These guys aren't the opponent. And I kind of like this progression because the first guy is trying to not smile. The second guy is doing a half hug and the third guy is doing a full hug. So it's totally worked, right? And it's subversive because you all like it too, right? It's right. It's fun, yeah. Uh, the, the photograph to the right is an army officer. I know that, yeah. Whereas the ones to the left are police officers, and there was a distinct. Whereas the, the police officers were identified as the uh, the ugly face of the regime. The army remained distant from that conflict. Mm -hmm. So th th they have very different significance. OK. You're, that's a very good point. And actually, what I would say is 
they have different significance, yes, got it, but I would, they're doing the same strategy to both, at least in these pictures. Mm, the one to the right was spontaneous. The, right. one to the, the ones to the left were part of the strategy. Okay. January 25th was chosen because it was police day. Yes. Mm, that was one of the reasons the demonstrations went out on that day. They said, we are going to ruin your holiday. Right. <laughs> right. It was totally intentional. Right. Okay, and uh, we're going to do it with hugs and kisses and flowers to embarrass you. And right. ended very violently. Right. Whereas the photograph to the right was the, 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 when the army took to the streets to replace the police. And this was more spontaneous. Okay. It's no longer the case now. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Well, your point is taken. Um, That's part of the problem. That can be part of the problem is when you have figureheads You've forgotten other larger figureheads, and it's something usually much larger that you're trying to fight up. Of well, it's incredibly difficult if you have an entire corrupt system to say we're going to take on the entire corrupt system. You try to take on half of it and then take on the other half, but it's, there's no clean, easy way to do it. Um, you know, your point about the difference between the military and the police, of course, is relevant to other struggles. I mean, in Serbia, for example, they understood that the interior police were much more loyal than the army, which was drawn largely, which had less social distance. It was closer to the civilian population. And Serb, maybe I should have used Serbs because they tried the strategy on both of them and it worked. But maybe in Egypt it was different. But the, the point is, someone said, hey, we're going to define... They also tried a long protracted period of time in Serbia. Mm -hmm. Right. Rather than swiftly. Right. Right. There's a great article, by the way, um, for those who are interested on the strategy that they used in Serbia and Ukraine to do this. And it was a long-term process like Mary talked about. I can direct you to it. I don't know a lot of research that's been done into security force defections and what movements have done to bring them about. But there's one article I can point people to if they're interested that hits on this exact issue, where they actually went and interviewed military people and police people afterwards and asked, what were you thinking and what was going on? Okay, great. So we have, okay, 25 minutes, great. Um, goals and aspirations. So what are movements fighting for? Oh, before that one, I just have a question on previous points you've, you've raised, especially for those of us who work on uh, minority uh, groups and indigenous peoples. That's one of the challenge, you know, <laughs> trying to frame a discourse yeah. or uh, trying to define perpetrators because in most cases as a minority your discourse could be very limited you know <coughs> to a certain geographical area or as indigenous community it's about say if it is land you know it's, it's, it's limited to your to your area and the, the the majority could even be beneficiaries of what you think as a, as a violation of your right as a minority group and uh, I'm, I'm i'm wondering how do you develop uh, a broader discourse when you know you have uh, the, the issues is limited? Yeah, you are a minority yeah, yeah. or indigenous uh, community. Part of, part of what I hear you saying is how do you deal with the issue of social distance? If you are a minority of 20% and the other 80% feels very distant from you and doesn't relate to you and feels that you're really different and other, how do you possibly overcome that? And I want to talk about part also benefit from your uh, whatever you think as, yeah. as exploitation. I have an example of that coming up later that may be useful, but I mean what you're talking about is an issue that's so big it really deserves its own session, um, because for because it is so important in certain cases, and particularly when we look at a case like Bahrain, my guess would be social distance is a huge issue, or Syria is another place where there's such fractionalization that finding a discourse of unity and commonality is really critical. Goals and aspirations. So how do movements define what they're for? Pamphleting. Pardon? Pamphleting. Pamphleting? OK, but I want like words, ideas. Again, think about traditional political speech. The politician gets up to the podium to make a speech. We stand for this, 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 and this, and this. What do movement, how do movements define what they're for? I mean, generally. Equality. Equality. Dignity. Justice. Justice. Better life okay. Slogans that sum them up in Egypt it was so why, yeah? dignity, freedom, social equality. 
Okay, so why are the, we talk, why are we talking in terms that are so broad? Why not a specific policy? Well, they do both. I mean, you have to do both. Like, these are slogans. The slogans get translated into demands that are very specific. <laughs> Right. If you go too deep into policy stuff, you divide people. Again. I mean, if, if Egyptians had decided part of their platform was going to be to talk, we are fighting for this particular division of religion and state or something, what would have happened? Is it, I mean, I, I don't know any, I, I know very few movements that are successful saying we want democracy and we want this kind of economic system. Usually enough, but sometimes they can say something like we want democracy and we want an economic system where people who work can make a fair wage without getting more specific than that. Sometimes this will work. But you get anti-privatization slogans, and you, you, you got some of that. I mean, you, the very broad slogans, yes, they were very sort of, uh, you know, to, to make them so that everybody can, can agree on that slogan. Right. And then, you, you know, now at this stage, you're getting more specific slogans and, and more, uh, uh, you know, special interest groups. They call them special interest groups, although I don't like that term. Yeah. You know, where you have labor fighting, labor fighting for labor rights or um, other trade unions fighting for their specific interests. They, they, they get slogans that are, you know, group specific. Sure. But I th my question is, what kind of slogans seem to get the most people? What kind of slogans are usually used in or issues? In how are the goals and aspirations usually defined in movements that are winning? Yeah. There's an interesting example from Kenya where people modeled on the opera movement. Yeah. Uh, they printed uh, T-shirts with a slogan: "MPs refuse to tax us. What should we do?" And they were all arrested because it was considered to be extremely provocative, but it got so much media attention. Mm. And some of the radio station actually were giving out the t-shirts and they were completely overwhelmed with people who wanted them. And the t-shirts really became something like the in thing to have because they weren't enough. So it was a very successful campaign mm. in that sense, although the leaders all got arrested for no reason. And, and even people just wearing a black t-shirt, like some people were saying that just wearing an orange uh, scarf you know, but these people were actually arrested just for wearing something on their own color. Mm -hmm. Which was black. Well, it seems that you can have your various movements for very specific goals, but when you're trying to do the mass movement, when you're trying to bring people in for that, the civil resistance that truly is broad and is going to be sweeping authoritarian dictators, whoever out of right. power, you want to be broad and. Yeah. There's a balance between campaigns. We're going to integrate buses in Montgomery. We're going to integrate downtown Nashville because we found we're going to overthrow the British salt laws in Gandhi's case. Very specific targeted points where a regime or an opponent could be a corporation is weak. And this is where campaigns come in. The discourse of movements is usually a broad discourse. Campaign discourse is usually specific discourse. And so if we look, for example, at how King defines the Montgomery bus boycott, one of the first meetings, he's using movement discourse. We already know this is about buses, but here's how he's framing it. My friends, we're certainly very happy to see each of you out this evening. We're here this evening for serious business. We're here in a general sense because, first and foremost, we are American citizens. We're determined to apply our citizenship to the fullness of its meaning. We're here because of our love for democracy, because of our deep-seated belief that democracy transformed from thin paper to thick action is the greatest form of government on earth. So yeah, our campaign's about the buses. Our movement is about asserting demo democratic citizenship. I remember I was in a workshop that Al Giordano was leading. And I was talking about the difference between 20,000 internet petition signatures and 20,000 signatures that were gathered door to door. What's the difference? Al can comment if no one else wants to, but. OK, Al, what's well, the difference? The organizer has established a relationship with the, the people whose doors that he and she knocked on, and, and actually has uh, a capacity to, to go back to that person and knows what their skills are and what their motives are and how to place them into doing something meaningful in the movement that's consistent with what they want to do. Uh, uh, and also, I think um, people who sign online petitions are much 
like people who uh, put bumper stickers on their car. Many of them think they've already done their thing for the cause, and you're, you're much less likely to get something more out of them than you are out of someone with whom you've established or begun to build a relationship. Right. So the key word there, as I hear, there were a lot of points made and, and good ones, but relationship. If I talk to you, I've gotten to watch your facial expressions. I've gotten to see how you react to my language. I've gotten to see how you describe your life to me. And if I want to be able to touch you with, with, with rhetoric, with discourse, get you active, the words I'm going to say to you are going to be a reflection of what you're telling me you feel. And so movement language is the language that's often very concrete in people's lives. Again, this is this sort of thing. On the one hand, they can be very general and broad, but on the campaign level again, they're, talk, they're, not, just saying, they're not just saying discrimination. They're talking about, you know, this person was beaten here, and we all, we saw, we all saw the pictures, you know, in our community or there. This person could have been you. Or this person was denied a wage or a medicine or something else. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Uh, I would like to add that uh, religion plays an active role in this kind of goal and inspiration. Because it was very, very clear. Like yesterday, Jim Stock talked about church mm -hmm. and the meetings of that church. And in Tahrir Square, there was like all this big gathering for people to pray together. So religion sometimes, like most of the time, is a common language for people. And when you are doing a movement, you want to find something in common where all people can bring together. Yeah, absolutely. We have ten, 10 minutes. I have a fair amount of more material, some of which I can definitely skip. But since we started late, can we go a little later? Or are you guys so jet lagged that, like, Everyone likes to talk, right? <laughs> OK, Constantine, yes. Uh, regarding religion, just a short remark. Uh, as in James' speech, for example, mm -hmm. we heard that religion can uh, help in the movement. But sometimes, as it happened in the Ukrainian case, a regime can use religion in order to protect its mm -hmm. uh, values. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ukraine's through, uh, yes. religion, the Russian. So regimes are trying to do this, too. and. God, I'll get you in one second. This brings me to this point of values. Part of the battle takes place about who represents values. Who represents cultural values, religious values, the nation's history, their patriotism? Who can claim that as their own? And yeah, regimes understand this very well and try to do it too. Got it. What were you going to say? Yeah, I was just going to get to values. Religion mm -hmm. can divide. Mm -hmm. yes. But values unite. Right. So it's, it's very. We promote values, but not religion as such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So you've got to work, I'll take your question. You've got to work with what we would call the existing emotional, symbolic, cultural vocabulary. And one of the challenges movements have is the existing symbolic vocabulary is working generally in the favor of the regime because they've already taken it and used it and said it's ours. So the movement needs to come up sometimes with new symbols, but usually they need to reclaim these symbols. If they try to come up with too much new material again, they just appear weird or other people can't relate to them. So it's always this fine balance. Was there a comment there before we go on? You know, I guess actually this is where I think is the heart of the matter around um, the cultural this dialogue around values. So yeah. earlier, the last conversation, um, the, the voter registration, if you use the higher aspirational value of transparency, who decides which, how that value is, is, de is defined? Mm -hmm. like it, can, like it can really work both ways. And to me, that, that's, there's like a, an intractability there. Mm -hmm. So justice means one thing for the Taliban, because they use that word all over the place, right. but it means something else for Afghan women. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do you, how do you counter that, that use of language? Well, which, right. Okay. I, I, OK. We do have to go on, but I'll say one thing. One way that movements define what they stand for is they don't just say the words. They do actions while saying the words so that justice is no longer a word that I'm telling you. It's something I'm doing. It's something I'm bringing about. So when people think about justice when I say it, they're thinking about the experience of watching me do this or participating in it with me. In Serbia, otpor was not just a word meaning resistance. Otpor was something that people's kids did. 
And it, that way it developed a very deep emotional resonance with them. Definitions were created by action, not just words. Okay, speaking of which, resistance, otpor, because I love Serbia. <laughs> Working with the existing cultural vocabulary. And the fist is also a, sim a symbol in Serbia too. Of, uh, okay. Yeah, Susanna. One important value uh, is solidarity, and I'm thinking about the case of mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, yes. that uh, when they started to say, uh, to build this discourse of one child, all children, like when all this political disappearance uh, happening in Argentina, when they start to promote this discourse, they, they got a lot of, of, uh, of uh, followers, like all, they, they just gather together and the, the movement becomes stronger. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We're, I'm going to keep going. So here's a quote that I found that I felt represented this. February 6th, youth, a bunch of representatives of youth movements met on Tahrir Square or youth organizations and came up with this statement of the Coalition of the Youth Revolution. Fellow Egy Egyptian, great Egyptian citizens, we are your daughters, your brothers, sisters, sisters who are protesting in Tahrir Square and other squares of Egypt. We are your family value. We are your family. We, us, our identity is shared by this value. And we promise you not to go back to our homes until the demand of your great revolution are, is realized. <coughs> Millions have gone out to overthrow the regime, and so the matter goes beyond figures in particular to the whole administration. Who's the perpetrator? This administration of the Egyptian state, which was transformed from a servant of the people to a master of them. That's us. Then they close it up. We have heard the president's disappointing speech, and really someone who has killed more than 300 youths, kidnaps, and injured thousands more is not entitled to brag about past glories. He cannot claim, he cannot claim Egypt's history as his own. He cannot claim our greatness as his own. Nor are his followers entitled to talk about the president's dignity, because the dignity of life and security of the Egyptian people is far more valuable than any single person's dignity, no matter how high a position he holds. So who is Mubarak? He's a single person. He's not the state anymore. I was talking to a friend of mine who went to Egypt, and he said, I saw more pictures of Mubarak in Egypt than I saw Egyptian flags. So he's trying to make, if you're criticizing Mubarak, you're criticizing Egypt, you must not be a patriot. They're completely tearing this to shreds in this statement. They're claiming values. And something I've heard Maché say before, which I think is brilliant, is by the end of a struggle, the dictator is no longer, uh, the dictator is like a foreign occupier in the land. It's not just like, oh yes, that's our president. It's, this is a foreign occupier. We are Egypt. We are this country. So, and finally, and then I'll get on to a few other things, discourse. Movements call people and remind them that they're powerful. United Farm Workers in California, a case which I'll go into more tomorrow, had a very simple slogan, si se puede, yes we can, which was popularized by who? <laughs> he thought it was very valuable to him politically to, to remind people that they were powerful, because it is powerful to remind people that they are powerful. But si se puede, the UFW, got there first. That was their slogan. Which is what? Yes we can. United Farm Workers. They're a union that, sta that started in California and in about 1965. And I'm going to go into more detail about who they are tomorrow. Gandhi, with another quote, reminding people that they're powerful. We're going to, knowledge and capacity are much quicker than discourse. So let's talk about knowledge. So yeah, discourse is really important to frame what's going on, for sure as a way to form a movement. But knowledge, knowledge of how to wage civil resistance is critical as well. I, I mean, I, don't, I would defer to the Egyptians here, but what I read, at least in the US press, was that Egyptians had been in communication with Tunisians and others for several years, exchanging strategies. And certainly, and, and, and that knowledge of what to do is critical. I mean, when you think about how destitute and bad things can get, how much oppression can happen to people, if they don't know what to do, are they in any, what do you see? Spontaneous riots, spontaneous outbursts, but not movements. So knowledge is really critical. What kind of knowledge are we talking about here? Listening? Yeah. 
things like uh, the, uh, the Tunisian activists over Facebook told the Egyptian activists to put onions under their scarves right. to protect them from tear gas. Protect from tear gas. So there's okay. tactical level knowledge for sure. There's also broader knowledge. Listening, communication, negotiating. Not just negotiating eventually perhaps with opponents, but negotiating coalitions laterally. Analytical skills. Where are we strong? Where are we weak? Where are they strong? Where are they weak? It was analytical skills that gave Gandhi the idea that the salt march would be the best possible option for British India, for, for the Indian independence movement in 1931. And he was right. So knowing where to push comes from analysis, planning, assessment of costs and risks of various courses of action, selecting objectives. All this is strategic. I mean, Reverend Lawson said it yesterday, every move we made, every move he and his movement made in Nashville was strategic. So knowledge matters enormously. Knowledge matters enormously. And when groups have knowledge, and it doesn't necessarily mean it came from the outside, a lot of times it's been indigenously developed, because most places have a, have a nonviolent history at some point in their history, or a past of organizers, and when they discover it, or create that history themselves, they learn a great deal. So I'll give you some examples of what I feel are brilliant early movement tactics that really help build movements that could not have happened without strategic knowledge. In Chile, in May 11, 1983, well, let's take it back a few days. The copper miners in Chile had wanted to organize a strike, and Augusto Pinochet, the extreme dictator of Chile at that time, surrounded the mine with his military units and basically <coughs> dared the copper miners to go on strike. So what did they do? They did not want to be martyrs. They called off the strike. But they said, if you agree with us, general population, if you agree with us, in several days, start walking slowly at night. And gradually, it, it, and it, well, three days later, people started walking slowly. A few days later, it was turn off your lights on and off at night. And then it was bang pots and pans. Now, this was in a society where, based on accounts I've heard, people were so afraid that at parties, if I met Lee, I would introduce myself and not say my own name or make up a name. And so would he. That's the level of fear. Because Pinochet could do pretty much whatever he wanted, or so it seemed. But by finding a really brilliant way to crack this fear, to completely decentralize things, it's very difficult to figure out if someone's walking slowly as part of a demonstration or not. And it's impossible to arrest everyone. And cars driving slowly, all the cars behind them have to drive slowly. But it had a remarkable psychological effect. Here's a quote. I don't have a quote from a Chilean, unfortunately. I'm sure some of you could find it. I don't speak Spanish very well. Uh, here's a quote from a Canadian journalist. It was amazing. It went way beyond what anyone would have thought was possible. May 11th was an explosion of joy and excitement. People were so amazed that they were raising their voices. They were speaking out. It was like Chile had just won the World Cup. This is the beginning of movement. Pinochet didn't actually end his rule until 88. This is the beginning. But well-positioned knowledge about what to do. This here is a 27-year-old organizer named M. Caselli Jack, who was organizing the Port Elizabeth boycotts in South Africa. Okay? And <clears throat> what M. Caselli Jack wanted to do was find a tactic that would be felt in the white community, because most of the tactics were taking place in black townships, and the white community in South Africa wasn't feeling the effects of them. So he launches, a, he and some of his organizers launch a boycott of white businesses. This guy was brilliant, brilliant organizer. Okay? So what did the government do? Well, compliance was very high among the black population. They did not shop. Okay? Businesses reported a 30% drop in revenues. Five days later, the government responds to the boycott by declaring a state of emergency. And here's, here's Jack's response to that. 
If they declared a state of emergency, they were panicking because they knew that we were becoming effective. They were feeling us coming, they were feeling us coming. So to us, the state of emergency showed that the country could not be governed as in the old days. Extraordinary measures were to be implemented in order to keep apartheid alive. And we knew then that we got apartheid in a crisis. And apartheid was in a crisis, and we were there, we were going there to give it the push, to push, to push. The state of emergency clearly showed that we were becoming very effective, and ordinary people were starting to see now the gains that they were making. So this, again, this application of strategic knowledge, at the beginning of what people would say was the last phase and the real nonviolent phase of the South African movement, its ability to create an early success is remarkable in forming a movement. This is sort of the tail end of a movement, I guess, but the beginning, the, the beginning of a campaign. February 1st, Mubarak comes on and says, I will not run for president again, and makes a long rambling speech. And this is a picture taken from Tahrir Square of the reaction. Okay? So they hadn't achieved anything yet. I mean, they had achieved something. They'd achieved a concession from Mubarak, but instead of saying, okay, we'll go home now, this success was very infectious. It said, oh my gosh, we're winning, we're going to keep doing this. Right? And one last quote. This is from the United Farm Workers, Cesar Chavez, he was a leader of them. After a strike in 1965 at 48 farms in Southern California, these farm workers were given a raise, and they thought, oh my gosh, we've given a raise. We finally won something because so many other strikes had failed. It was a mistake for them, the farmers, to have a wage increase so soon after the strike started. We could exploit that. It showed the workers were being effective. They should have held out impressing their crews by how strong they were. And it was a mistake for them to move their crews away from the road to the middle of the field. Their crews, meaning all the scab workers they tried to bring in to get them away from all the pickets and protesters. This sh that showed the crew that we were powerful and that the boss was afraid of us. We could exploit that too. None of this happens without knowledge. And in the, in the case of the United Farm Workers, failed strikes, failed actions, led to the acquisition of this knowledge that led to success. So finally, capacity. And I can actually wrap this up in three minutes. Discourse matters, knowledge, but you've got to have civil society either organize itself or be there ready to be organized. So let's look at some examples. We already talked about Egypt, how perhaps the April 6th movement of 2008 builds solidarity between different groups, students, activists, intellectuals, and urban centers, laborers that later became useful. In Pakistan, 2005, 6, 7, there was the lawyers' movement when Musharraf, President Musharraf, forced uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court there to resign. Well, lawyers already had organizations, they just used them. Gandhi, of course, engaged in constructive program, years of building self-reliance education, training, services. It's important to remember, movements don't necessarily just engage in nonviolent actions. They educate and they serve people as well. This builds capacity. In what's now Pakistan, at that point, the Northwest Frontier Province, Badshah Khan organized a nonviolent army. He built his capacity of people wearing uniforms. They were called the Khuda Hidmagar, which means servants of God. They had drills, a pledge, an oath, to service. He built this capacity. In India, here's another example, much more recent, from 1984 to 86. I was talking a, with a guy who helped organize uh, rural poor whose river was being polluted by two major companies upstream. The fish were dying, livestock were dying, people were getting sick. And these companies were tied to the Birla Group, which is one of the largest conglomerates in India. And the government wasn't responding to anything that these people wanted. So what did the people do? First thing they did is they started self-organizing themselves to, to read the water for toxicity and gather all the data they needed. This wasn't just about getting the data. This was about producing capacity. And so on and so forth. I don't have time to go into these others. Mary King will talk about, I'm sure, the capacity that was built prior to the first Palestinian intifada from 87 to 89, all the capacity built before then. But capacity doesn't just necessarily exist, it can be built is the point. And there are lots of cases outlining how. Now, in terms of mobilizing capacity, I'll give one quick example and then we'll be done. 
I'm going to draw from the United Farm Workers again. In 1965, this organization was migrant laborers in California. I think, what was the statistics? It was something like 60%, 70% were under the federal poverty line. These were people that had virtually no working rights. Whatever unions in the United States existed, farm workers were written out of laws on worker protections. They had nothing. They were homeless. I mean, migrant, by nature, means they have to move from job to job. Enormous amounts of social distance between predominantly Latinos, Mexicans, and Filipino farm workers and the rest of the U.S. population. So how do these people possibly get unions, churches, students, and other people interested in their cause? There's all this capacity that could mobilize, but how do they possibly get this capacity to join them? Well, he saw an opportunity in 1965 when there was a sheriff named Roy Gallion, and he decided, as sort of overstepped the Constitution a little bit. He, declined, he, he basically said, it's illegal for anyone to organize, any farm workers to organize anywhere in my county. Just a little overstep. And so they saw an immediate opportunity to organize people. And so October 16th, this guy here, his name's David Havens. He was a reverend. Okay, Mexican population, Filipino population was generally Catholic. And he gets up at a demonstration and reads, you know, words of protest, I won't go into it now, and gets arrested and suddenly there's an image of a reverend, white, well-dressed, and is, you know, getting arrested. And suddenly this farm worker issue has an image that is, that speaks frankly, to white people, to the larger audience, to people, who are, to people of faith, saying our cause isn't just our cause, it's also your cause. And actually, I couldn't find a picture of this actually happening, but it was such a big deal in the farm worker movement that they put it on their calendar, which is why <laughs> I got this image. A few days later, the sheriff decided he was going to outlaw the word huelgo, which means strike in Spanish. Okay, just a little overstep of the Constitution again. Okay? Now this is at the height of the free speech movement. Okay? That was a movement very popular among students in the 1960s. So this here is Dolores Huerta holding up, she's a major organizer in that movement, holding up a sign that says Huelga. Okay? They invited media, they invited everyone there, they disobeyed the law and the sheriff arrested them. Well just that day it happened that Cesar Chavez, the leader, happened to be in UC Berkeley and gave a speech about just this very day, farm workers have been you know, arrested for exercising their rights of free speech. And then he went on to University of San Francisco and Stanford and so forth. What did he get? He got students involved, he got unions involved, he got religious folks involved. He collected $6,700 in 1965, and I was so interested in how much that was, I adjusted it for inflation. It's $48,000. $48,000 in two days. This movement started with $82 in its bank account several months earlier. National media attention, student volunteers, and then people who were arrested for violating this free speech, you know, anti-speech law. Students called, sent telegrams, letters, and then demonstrated outside the courthouse and got these people, arrested, got these people released mobilizing capacity, bridging social distance. There are a lot more examples, but this is just one. We're out of time. Thank you very much.